Uh, first off, welcome everybody. If anybody wants any food, there's more pizza coming probably, so it's all good. Salad and stuff. So before we get started, I want to introduce the rest of our team. Um, first is my wife, Gina, and my partner. Say hi. Uh, Gina received her undergraduate degree from Boston University with me, and also her uh, master's degree from FAU. And let's see who else we got. Oh, we got my son, David. My younger son, David. David, say hi. Swift. So, so David officially is now a second class scout. He just got, just uh, re received his, uh, his uh, badge. Badge. That's okay. That's why it took a while. And uh, he's going to be first class probably in two or three weeks. We're doing a little bit of an accelerated thing. And it's neat. Whenever you get a badge, you know what they do? Beyond they give a little speech about and test them on the stage, is they give a pin to the wife, to the mother. So, so Gina is collecting pins. Because I've, I've done all the work, right? You've done all the work. <laughs> <laughs> not, nothing I've done. But, um, but David is uh, finished his finish eighth grade, so we're putting him to work, as they say. Uh, that being said, I also have Kavita. Where's Kavita today? Oh, there he is. Yeah? Oh, I'm not there? Okay. I'm, I'm, I will not forget the special guest. So Kavita Raju is our uh, business transfer and service specialist, and she has been with us for a bunch of time. <laughs> and uh, she has a lot of experience, but I'm not going to tell you how long, because every time she says it's not enough, or it's too much, not much. You always make me younger. I always make her younger. <laughs> um, she um, got her degree from FSU, and um, let's see what else about her. Oh, well, let's see. She brought a special guest. Actually, a special guest came. Today. Special guest, uh, Carrie, wait. So Carrie is her husband. Uh, Carrie is, uh, does IT work, and he's a bit of an expert himself, and he's ready to learn stuff. And no challenge. No, 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 no challenge. We all, we all know everything. It's all good. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Darren. Darren Ernst is next to me also. Uh, Darren is our, uh, he runs our Insurance and Fixed Investment Department. He went to Drake University in Iowa. That's where Drake is, by the way. Uh, he was a senior person at Prudential, and he's quite a bit of an expert in a lot of things. And um, we actually had a very interesting experience recently where Darren gave a part of the uh, top 10 retirement tips, and everybody said, everybody said he was a, the one with, with the best part of the speech, the presentation. So that was very impressive. I spoke with him, so, <laughs> so I, it obviously tells me that he's really good. So we actually got very much encouraged, and we actually are putting together a presentation coming up, which I'll talk about in two minutes, that he's going to be one of the speakers at. You're going to enjoy this. Um, let's see, who's Lauren? Oh, there it is. Hi, Lauren. So, so Lauren is my uh, our marketing coordinator. She went to University of Florida. She's been with us for at least five years. And Let's see, what's some interesting fact about Lauren? Uh, well, a, I paddle a dragon boat. She paddles a dragon boat. That's, that's an interesting fact, if you ever heard of paddling, paddling story. Um, I want to also want to say, first off, I can't thank you all enough for coming to these dining discoveries. You're really making them pop in and they're in demand. And I'm not going to talk to you back in a moment. No. Okay. Um, we have, we're growing, and I see that. I see we have more and more people coming. About, I would say about 95% of you are clients. So those who are clients, thank you for coming. And those who are not clients, thank you for coming. Um, thank you for coming. That's good. Now, I love it when you guys come, but I want to talk a little bit about housekeeping because we're trying something new today. We have two new things. One is there's a sheet that Lauren gave you when you first came in. It's kind of like an evaluation sheet. If you already have your stuff, just print your name. You don't have to write, if you don't have a new cell phone or whatever, don't do it. Unless you want, I'm sorry, if you've done it, you do it. It's a good double check. And after, not before Adam speaks, please rank him and also rank the other items. And also, if you guys um, have other ideas of other topics you want to hear spoken of, you can write it in. And if you want to give us a uh, mention of somebody you could think for benefit from our services, you can put their name down and we'll talk about if we connect, them, connect with them or not. We're always trying to expand. 
Referrals are a lot less expensive than anything else we could do. And it's kind of like saving money, but thrifty. It's one of the things I learned from the voice test. Now, I have three things that I want to bring up. Uh, one is on July 11th, and we'll get emails on this. We're bringing back one of our speakers from last year, and the topic is, is called Cover Your Assets Part 2. <laughs> and it's hurricane preparedness. Is understanding hurricane insurance, understanding how to prepare yourself for a hurricane. Very popular last year. We're trying to do this right before hurricane season. The next thing is on August 22nd, we're having a, a guest speaker with our friend here, Darren. And we're going to be talking about long term care planning. How the most secretive best ways of paying for long term care today. It's a really good topic. And it's, the rules are changing, and we're going to learn all about that. And what I'm most important, most excited about is something coming up on September 27th. We're not going to be doing it at this, uh, this hotel because we don't have enough room. Um, I'm expecting to have at least 100 people attend, so plenty of room. And we might do a different style, like classroom style, so everybody can hear better. Um, but I'm bringing a speaker in. I've already got one person who is September 27th, and this woman named Kezia, who is an expert in alternatives, and other types of investments that do really well in volatile times. She's an excellent speaker. I heard her speak in Michigan recently at one of the conferences. And she generously agreed to speak. And um, She's been writing the thought for the week. Too, yeah, so we we've been, her name. Oh yeah, we hired her for, for writing the thought of the week. The email oh. we blast out. We've been reading, you know, she, yeah. Mike used to do it, she took a little break. And now we're having Casey again. So if she advises or manages about eight and a half, nine billion dollars. She actually knows what she's doing, which is kind of cool. But it's going to be a nice setting for everything. Okay, so fill that out. Um, let me introduce, guys, I'm glad everybody's here. This is good. This is going to be a fun one. So at this point, I've given everybody enough time to relax and chew. It's good. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker, um, Adam Stein, right back there. Say hi to everybody. Say hi to Adam. Hey. Hi. So, so Adam works for Dedicated IT. Now, Adam's company is very unique the fact that it has a lot of very, I would say, young people working. But I guess it's very common now in the IT department area. Um, I think, how many employees, Adam? I think we're at 31. At 31 employees, local, really knows their stuff. Everybody I've spoken to has a good sense of this group. Uh, multiple offices. I know, you're, I know you have an office here in the, in the gardens. But you also have offices north. Melbourne and Florida. Melbourne and Florida. And Adam has pretty much every certification imaginable. At least that's what it says on his LinkedIn. That's good. Um, one, of, one of Adam's passions, uh, something I enjoy also, is running. And he recently ran uh, part of a uh, trek in North Carolina. It wasn't part of the Appalachian Trail, but it was up a mountain, right? It was up a mountain. It was up a mountain. Anybody who can run up a mountain, that's pretty cool, right? What was the elevation? Uh, 6,600 feet. Uh, we went from 3,000 to 6,600, and then back down to 3,000, and back up to 6,000, and then back down to 3,000. Uh, uh, quite a bit. That's pretty cool. Short answer. So that's what he did. <laughs> and I'm standing. That was excellent. He's still standing. Now, at this point, I'd like to introduce that man when he come up. He's got his really cool slides, and we're going to get going. Lord, did I miss anything? Did you know? <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, let's see, is this good, Mike? About that level there? Is that good? Yep. Cool, cool. I'm going to try to do this. My, my technology actually failed me today, so I'm uh, using uh, Peter's laptop, and uh, I'm going to have to kind of struggle through here. But we're going to see if I can make it work. Uh, uh, again, I, I appreciate you all coming to see me. I understand this is the, the biggest one yet, and I'm, I would imagine it's because you saw my name. You know. Who I am. Uh, I'm kind of an important thing, at least my mom says so. She's, uh, so today we're going to be talking about cybersecurity and identity theft. Not identity, but identity theft. Um, uh, so you'll have to forgive me. Part of the technical uh, error this morning or this afternoon is that uh, we're missing a little bit of the screen, but primarily uh, it is unimportant white space. So we're going to roll through here. I think I have what? I have 30 minutes. I think. Okay. 
I'm going to roll through here about as quickly as I can while educating, entertaining, and uh, attempting to not bore you because I know tech geek, geek people like me often get a bad rap. And if I, if I fail, I'll, I'll let you join in and you can just step up and take care of the presentation if I'm, if I'm failing on the IT side. Um, so we're going to run through who this dude is. Uh, I'm going to try to frame the problem, talk about why it's so rampant. I'm going to give you some real world examples to what's going on and uh, really, really world uh, stuff because I actually made this presentation today. So it is hot off the presses with some real good examples. And then what you can do to try to protect yourself going forward. So uh, about me, I think uh, Peter hit most of the stuff, but I'm the founder and the CEO of Dedicated IT. Uh, my, responsible, or my responsibilities lie in uh, casting vision, managing the culture of the organization, and then trying my best to uh, handle service delivery. Uh, I got James, actually, if you raise your hand, right there, James Kraft, he's my VP of service. Actually, sorry, operations director. Um, and he is in charge of, of really making it happen. I just take credit for it. Uh, I've been in the industry for 25 years. I've done just about everything there is to do as far as network consulting goes, from a very, very small law office to hospitals, airports, uh, hotels, uh, government stuff, you, you name it. Uh, I would tell you about the government stuff, but I have to kill you, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, the really high, high end stuff. Uh, I do like to run a lot. Uh, 50K is my preferred distance. Uh, that's 50K, not 5K. And uh, I've got a family. So this is me from this weekend. Uh, this was Saturday at about 11.30 in the morning, uh, mile 16 or so. And I got to mile 20 before they kicked me off the mountain because I wasn't going fast enough. But the picture's pretty cool. Uh, family, cute kids, awesome, beautiful, smart wife and uh, a rebel. So that's my family. <laughs> so uh, about us, so Dedicated IT, we exist to uh, ultimately make our clients better tomorrow than they were today or better today than they were yesterday. Uh, we do that by really just delivering what they need, when they need it, on time, on budget, and uh, doing it over and over again while uh, ultimately having as much fun as the legal system allows us to. Um, I don't know that we've broken any laws this week. And we are one of the fastest growing IT companies in South Florida. Um, we're way bigger than your average IT company that does what we do. Not quite IBM yet, but we're working on it. So uh, cybersecurity, jumping right in. So ultimately, cybersecurity, is, it's a marketing term. And it is about protecting your data, your systems, by using equipment or software or processes or training or all kinds of things. In the olden days, we used to call that just security. We used to be a security engineer, but now it's cybersecurity. I think we can make extra money a year uh, if we call it cybersecurity. Uh, I pulled this stat today, actually, that the uh, cybercrime is going to cost the world $6 trillion annually by 2021, up from $3 trillion in 2015. Uh, eventually, it is going to surpass all of the illegal drug trade in the world combined. Um, that's a huge stat. I saw that, I was like, what? So, I don't know that it's true, but it seemed good enough, so I threw it in the presentation. <laughs> so, um, what are these threats? And, I, and there are a ton of them out there, but I think the ones that require the most attention are these three. Viruses, phishing, and hacking. So, we'll talk about viruses. So, in the good old days, uh, back when we, uh, you know, I'd say probably 1990, somewhere in that area, you know, you used to hand a floppy disk to a coworker or to a partner company or something, and you, you'd get infected. And it pretty much made your day terrible, maybe a couple days terrible, but it was centralized to that one computer. You lost a little bit of data or it wouldn't boot up, and you called in the 14-year-old kid to come over to your house or to your business to clean it up. and you know, ultimately, he or she would put the kid, you know, put the pieces back together, and uh, you'd be along your way. Uh, ultimately, they were written by people mainly just to see that they could. A bunch of geeks just kind of seeing what they could possibly do and get a little kudos and, and uh, chest thumping for uh, for getting these things to populate across the world. Because we weren't quite as connected, they moved slowly. 
You know, it might be one computer or two computers, but it wasn't a big deal. Um, and that was the good old days, and I yearn for those days. Starting around 1999, uh, we started having the viruses that were spreading through email, which meant the acceleration and the ability to hop from computer to computer and person to person, um, it, was, it, it really accelerated, and it, it caused much uh, bigger problems than it used to be. They still would prevent your computer from booting up, or they would delete some files, but again, it, was, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't terrible. Uh, assuming that you had a good backup. And again, these were most often just people just seeing if they could do it. There, there really was no reason for it other than that, just to be annoying. Uh, I, I looked at kind of that time period. The I love you virus is the one that most people would remember at that time, or at least people like me remember. And the interesting thing with that one is, it was the first one to really use email and really do a good job at hiding itself and populating across the earth. And within 10, or sorry, within uh, a few hours of its release, there were millions of Windows computers affected. Within 10 days, there was 50 million infections. And there was an estimated damage of somewhere between 5.5 billion and 8.7 billion from one computer virus. That was when things started to happen, that, these rapid infections. So then, the next series of, of things happened. And around 2013 was the first viruses that started to require a ransom. So now what happens is you click the little thing, it infects your computer, and instead of just being annoying and preventing it from booting, it now looks at all of the things that are important to you, your pictures, your financial documents, your Word and Excel documents, pretty much everything that matters to you on that computer. It now encrypts. And then it pops up a thing that says, if you want your data back, you need to send X amount of Bitcoins to this address on the dark web and blah, 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 blah. Really annoying. And um, now all of a sudden, instead of just it being a, 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 a chest thumping exercise for some geek in his uh, mom's basement, uh, now it's become a money making thing. And there are very, 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 very profitable um, and very expensive. So uh, I, I threw this stat together here. So we're expecting to do $11.5 billion annually uh, by 2019. This is up from 325 million in 2015. So you can see the massive explosion of these types of viruses and how they can impact you financially. And it's no joke. There's, there's not just a program that you install and it decrypts it for you. You literally can't get your data. You have, you have two options. You restore from backup or you buy Bitcoin. Those are really your two options at this point. You can't hire a smart enough geek to fix it. So moving on, you know, as we got to go through the timeline here, we've got phishing. So uh, by, by show of hands, who knows what a, a phishing is? And we're not talking about lakes and streams. So a few hands, okay. So uh, phishing, the term phishing with a PH, was coined around 1999 when people were ultimately phishing for passwords on America Online. And um, they spell it PH because originally uh, in the hacking days in the 80s, uh, they had things called phone freaking, which is cracking uh, the phone system. And uh, they spelled it with a PH, so when this became phishing, they added the PH to it. That's why it's spelled weird. And ultimately, the goal was to throw lures out onto the World Wide Web, the vast internet, and catch fish much like you would throw a lure into a lake. And you're obviously not going to catch every fish, but you're going to grab one. So this particular type of uh, threat or hack is a game of numbers. They're going to cast out a million lures, and they're going to get five, six, seven of them. And that's good enough for them. Um, and originally, in 2003, so they moved from the you know, getting uh, email addresses and passwords from AOL down to uh, present day, where they would try to mimic an eBay site or a PayPal site. Now, again, this is back in 2003. Internet's still pretty young. Uh, we all don't really understand what we're getting into security-wise and not really understanding that this stuff exists. It's new. 
So you'd get an email that looked like it would come from eBay or PayPal, and it would say, you know, validate your account information. You know, transmission coming through or something, and you'd click it, you'd go to a website, the website would look just like a PayPal or eBay site. You'd put your account information in there, and you'd think that you were doing something right, when in fact, you were putting your account information into this hacker's website, and they're getting your data to use for whatever they're gonna use it for. Uh, I threw a website, I'm gonna put these up here later, but there's a, a website called phishing.org that has a, a ton of information, it's written in plain English, uh, I actually had a good time just sitting down and reading it today, and I guess that says a little bit about me, but uh, I enjoyed it. So, phishing is kind of a general term. Um, there are some specific ways that phishing happens. So you have your email and spam phishing, which is that cast of the net. It's the throw a lure in the middle of the ocean and hope you get a couple. That's, um, and I'll show you some examples of that in a little bit, but that's very, very prevalent. I'm sure most of you guys have gotten it at this point. Um, it happens all day, every day. To, I think it was like every 16 seconds there's an email that hits a business or something I read today. So the next type of phishing is spear phishing. These are where rather than uh, just casting into this massive ocean and hoping that any fish bites, they're now starting to target who they are. So they know a little bit about the your company, or yourself, or services that you subscribe to, or hobbies that you like, or the name of your friends, or whatever it is, but it allows them to get just a little more specific on that email that comes in to trick you. You know, I, I look at it as if we're keeping with the actual phishing FISH, uh, the lure that they're using is specifically crafted for that type of water, for that type of fish, and it's good. That's what spear phishing is. The next one is, Fishing, which interestingly enough, I didn't know what th that really was until a few weeks ago, and I'll, I'll tell you an example of that one here pretty soon, but um, ultimately these are the phone calls that you get. Random number, you pick up the phone, it's like, hey, this is AT&T, we'd, we'd like to verify you. That is phishing, or voice phishing. Moving on is smishing. I don't know where they come up with these names, it's so funny <laughs> to me. Um, but this is SMS, or ultimately text message phishing. So these are where you're starting to get text messages from places that you may not know, or people that you may not know, and they're trying again to just get you to give them a little bit of information. There's keyloggers, uh, which ultimately is a way of capturing every keystroke that you take on your keyboard. So it's gonna get a bunch of junk, um, you know, emails to your, your relatives, your friends, whatever, but it's also gonna capture that username and that password, or your credit card number, or your social security number, or whatever that private information is. And it just goes in this massive database and they run algorithms on it and they try to pull out the interesting data from it. You've got card skimmers, which you've heard about in the gas station pumps, I'm sure. Uh, all of these are methods of phishing for personal information. Any questions so far? All right, so then we got hacking, the next step. So uh, a few important definitions, vulnerabilities. So every piece of software ever created uh, by man or woman uh, is gonna have errors. We're human, we're gonna, make, we're gonna make bugs. And ultimately those bugs, sometimes it just means the program doesn't work the way you want it to. Sometimes it means it's left the door open for somebody or something to come in. And ultimately that's what a vulnerability is. Those vulnerabilities are often patched about once a month. Those are those Windows updates that you get or the Apple iOS update or whatever it may be. Those happen about once a month. The next one is a zero day flaw. So this is where a bug exists in a piece of software. It is unpatched, it's unknown to the people who made the software, and somebody has just figured out that this bug exists. Those are called zero day exploits and there's really no good way to protect yourself from them. It's not like I can call Microsoft and be like, hey, I need that patch for that thing that just happened. They're like, we just found out about it too. And uh, good luck. And often guys like us, or companies like ours, will get um, knowledge-based articles or briefs that say, okay, you can't fix this thing right now, but if you turn this thing off, or you uninstall this, or you change this setting, you can temporarily mitigate the risk. Botnets. 
those are where you've gotten, for instance, a thousand or hundreds of thousands of computers that have that zero day exploit or vulnerability that hasn't been patched, and somebody takes it over almost like a zombie computer in the background. You don't know it's happened, but they have control of your computer. And then what they do is, if you guys are all computers, I'll send a signal to you that says, hey, I want you to do 10 million emails, or I want you to go find other computers that are vulnerable. And then I turn you into my little computer army to go and find other people that are having problems. DNS hijacking. So when you type www.google.com, you're going to a server, and that server is giving you an address. Much like your house has an address on your street, computers have addresses on the internet. And if you can go in and you, you can change it, or as, as a, an attacker, I could go into your computer, and I could make it so the DNS server that you're supposed to be looking at, I change it and I have you look at my DNS server. And then I can hand you whatever address I want. So you go to bankofamerica.com, your browser says you're in the right place, but in fact, you're on my server. That's what a DNS hijacking does. I threw another here, it'll be at the end, but the Hacker News is another website I actually found today. Again, I really enjoyed reading it. Scary as hell, because it ultimately is article after article after article of the things that have been found recently. And you can see the speed at which these things are happening. It's incredible. All right, so why do they do this? Showing off? Retaliation to somebody? Corporate espionage, state secrets, money, uh, but it works. So ultimately, I would say it's probably the bottom two, maybe a little bit at the top, but money. It is big, big business. And the sad thing is, we don't know what we're doing. So unfortunately, as our company, we've had people call us, our clients, not our clients, where we've recommended a certain backup system, maybe they didn't buy it, maybe they called us after it happened and we've never seen their system before, and we could not help them. And we've paid the money. We've bought Bitcoins, we've sent them to this address and whoever the hell knows where it is, and I don't know what terrorist group we funded by buying this. I mean, you're, you're laughing, but I mean, it's serious. I mean, you don't know where that money is going. It's, it's blind, Bitcoin. So uh, the government specifically says, do not pay the ransom. One, because you don't know what terrorist organization you're funding, and two, it just encourages them. So, uh, but when you've got a company and you got 80 mouths to feed and your data's gone, you pay the money. So, to recap, viruses trashed computers, then they started spreading really, really quickly. Then they started encrypting your data and charging you a ransom. The new one, I didn't touch on this before, I kind of threw this in there in the middle, but starting about October of last year, the incidents of ransomware, where they encrypt your computer and hold you hostage, have actually dropped off a very steep cliff. They're still happening very, very rapidly, but instead of the, so the downhill of ransomware is happening, the uphill of actual mining is occurring. So rather than them coming in and impacting your computer where your data's gone and you charge money for it, instead, what they do is they create a botnet, remember the botnet situation, of a bunch of computers that do what's called mining of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, uh, it's not like you go to the bank, or it's not like the US Treasury where they just print money, which is unfortunate, I don't know, you probably talk about that part of it, but uh, the way that Bitcoins come to exist is you actually use the power of your computer to do mathematical formulas that create Bitcoin. That's how the money is made. So what they do is, rather than coming in and encrypting all your data and wrecking havoc, they come in, they encrypt your, sorry, they infect your computer, they turn it into that botnet, and then they have it do those mathematical formulas in the background. You don't even know it's happening. And you're making them money. And what they've decided now is, that might be smarter to have 10 million computers generating a penny a piece every hour than encrypting a computer and dealing with this Bitcoin cryptoware transaction. This is cool stuff. Um, phishing, so phishing's gonna hope to get your user data. And uh, I was talking to one of the guys who worked today, and he's like, well, why would they care if, if you gave them the last four of your social? And, you know, for obvious reasons, that's scary. But I think it's because they go, they get your name from someplace, they find your birth date from another, they get the last four of your social here, 
they now have this, they, and it's like they just start collecting all of this data, and I'm sure it goes into some massive database somewhere that they're selling in the dark net. And little pieces of breadcrumbs here and there don't seem like it's that bad, but when you put them all together, you get a loaf of bread. Uh, spear phishing does the same thing that phishing does, but with really intense focus that, that is really scary. I'm going to tell you a story a little bit about that. And again, why? Because it works, and it's really profitable. So, um, I was kind of playing around here. So, which one is it? Is, is this uh, Yanni or Laurel or Blue or Gold? Um, anybody know what those mean? Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. um, so, is the problem a technology problem where our systems are not installed properly or configured properly or they're inherently broken, or is this a human problem? So, by hand, is this a human problem? Yeah. And I got a few. Is this a computer problem? So, um, let's see, I think, okay, yeah, I got a video I'm going to play here real quickly. I will download suspicious software. Oh, the lips are going to be so messed up on this. I will download suspicious attachments. I will download suspicious apps. Mm -hmm. If there were a button that said download malware, I'd click it. Well, I'll download the plague. I'll download the plague. And I'll it everywhere. I will visit suspicious websites. Gambling. Pornography. BitTorrents. FreeStreamingMovies.com. FreeLicenseCodes.com. FreeNuclearCodes.com. ExpensiveLawsuit.com slash We're All Going to Prison. I will help that Nigerian prince transfer some money. He's not a prince for crying in the night. He needs some help. And in return, he's going to help me out. We're going to be friends. We might even get married. I love uh, meeting new people. If something sounds too good to be true, <laughs> it probably is true. I don't even know where Nigeria is. I, I think it, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I will lose my smartphone, my tablet, my laptop, on an airplane, in a taxi, in my hotel, in Thailand, at Target. I was swimming and blogging, and then I was just swimming. I will be unable to configure my email software. Oh, no. Even if you tell me how to do it. I won't even be listening. You're thinking about other things. Machine guns. Puppies. Clowns. The Crimean War. The long-term effects of chloroform. Um, a, a goat. <laughs> so, uh, I think that kind of answers the question. Uh, you know, is this a technology problem or is this a human problem? And ultimately, humans make, take, make the technology, so we know it's that. But, uh, that scenario is basically what my company deals with every single day. Is <laughs> somebody calling and going, I transferred the money to the Nigerian prince. And you're like, really? Uh, really? So uh, it is the, uh, the number one problem with people, our, our people. So when I knew I was going to speak about two weeks ago, I started just keeping every email that I got that was an illegitimate email. So here are actual live emails from my email box recently um, that I've received. So this is an example of phishing. Uh, some of you guys probably can't read it, but basically it says that uh, I got incoming messages returned to sender. Uh, click this button right here to recover the messages. Okay, yeah, of course I want those messages, right? Uh, here's a password update that was required. Click here. Uh, here's a SharePoint. I received a fax. That fax is really important. Does anybody get a fax nowadays that is actually important? Raise my hand. Maybe? I don't, I don't even know why we have fax numbers anymore, honestly. We know either. I got a security alert. I need to review the recent activity, for sure. Uh, oh, that document my client sent me is really, really important. Form C. Uh, so those emails, literally, and, and like, I think I started capturing them on the 11th. Like, that, that many. And those are the ones that made it through. I can't even imagine how many are actually, you know, our system actually blocked. But you guys are getting them too, I guarantee you. 
Here's an example of spear phishing. So this one here, and I probably shouldn't even say this, but this is one of my clients. So I got one in my inbox from a client sent from the guy with a DocuSign, which I use, saying that there's an encrypted message. Those are the ones that are scary. That's the spear phishing one. Uh, so here is a crazy real world scenario that I uh, came across this morning. Walk into the office and I hear, hey, uh, did you hear about ABC Company? And I went, no. And they went, so I sat down and I started being briefed on it. And ultimately, the CEO of ABC Company sent an email to two people on their staff that said, please transfer $100,000 to these accounts. And interestingly enough, uh, the CEO actually didn't send it, but his email address did. And it was formatted in the same way that he normally would request that transfer. And it was sent to the same two people who would normally get that email. Luckily, those two people are not those people that we saw in that video. And they thought about it before they sent 100 grand out to this account. But when we started investigating, what we found was there was a woman there who had administrative rights to their company so that she could make changes to the email addresses and ad groups and change passwords, legitimate stuff. Well, last week she clicked on one of those emails that I just showed you that said, you need to reset your password a week ago. She went to the website, tried to reset her password. She said it didn't do anything, no big deal, didn't think anything of it. Yesterday at 1 p.m., um, she, again, didn't realize, or she saw it, but didn't think it was worth telling us. All of a sudden, a bunch of email boxes popped up in her inbox. So she started seeing the CEO's inbox as well as about four other people out of nowhere. Again, no reason to tell us, not at all. Um, then, around that same time, uh, the person, when we trace this back, the hacker at that point, used that account because she put her password in, to hop over to the CEO's uh, inbox, started searching his inbox and the sent items for wire transfer. And he found, or the hacker, he or she found, messages in the sent items that were legitimate wire transfers. That person then used the format that the CEO usually uses, determines who to send them to, and ultimately created the own message, sent it as the CEO. That's some serious crap. I mean, scary. That's what spear phishing is. Okay? Uh, and, and, it, and it happened. I mean, it's not like this person is, is, a, is, is an idiot. It's not like uh, she isn't a smart person. It's just, it seems so real that you fall for it. So that happened literally this morning. Here's another one. Uh, about a week ago, I saw this on my buddy's uh, Facebook. And he said, hey, my phone just rang with my phone number on the screen. It was his yeah, own yeah, phone yeah. number. You guys probably got it, right? Yeah. Uh, boy said, hey, AT&T, your account is flagged for security. Please enter the last four digits of your uh, social security number. So, okay, I got my cell phone. My cell phone's safe. It's not like it's my email. I get a phone call that says, I mean, it's from my own number. How the heck do you do that if you're a hacker, right? My own phone called me. AT&T, I'm an AT&T subscriber. And, I mean, it seems legit. Let me put my four in there. Well, now they got the last four of your social. They know that you're an ATT subscriber. They have your phone number. I would imagine there's enough things on this planet that they can unlock with those three pieces of information. Uh, here's smishing. So that, that other one was vishing with a V. Uh, here's smishing. So these are three examples of text messages. Uh, the left one says, from member services at AmericanExpress.com, account alert, dear member, your American Express account has been restricted to remove restrict uns. Please, uh, please confirm your identity now at 866-568-4 blah blah blah. Thank you for your membership. Next one over, your Apple has been unlocked. Click here to to uh, to lock it. Or sorry, your Apple ID has been locked. Click here to unlock it. The next one over was a Wells Fargo. Hey, your card starting with blah 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 has been deactivated. Please contact us at this number. All of them are scams. I mean, that somebody's text messaging me. It seems legit. I'm definitely a American Express customer. Dude. All right, got five minutes. Um, so here is uh, the stuff that I think you should know. So hopefully, by show of hands, I scared the hell out of you today. Anybody? Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. All right. Good. Job done. I'm gonna leave now. All right. So here's what you can do. Um, when you get an email, 
hover your mouse over the links. I'm going to show you what that looks like in a second. But instead of clicking the link immediately that says reset password, download thing, get the file, recover thing, check activity, just move your mouse cursor over it and it's going to pop up with the address that it's going to go to if you click that link. And nearly every time, it's going to say something other than the company that, send, that supposedly is sending that to you. Look for misspellings. Look for inconsistencies or sloppiness in the format. Consider the context. Why is my mom asking for my social security number? I don't know, right? Um, when on a website, ensure that the address makes sense. For instance, bankofamerica.com, that's a good one. Bankofamerica.com.mybank.cn, not good. Just because it says Bank of America in it doesn't mean it's actually Bank of America. The real web address that you're going to is mybank.cn. CN is China. So your bank is probably not in China. That's one of the tricks that they use. Look for the word secure or a company name with a lock in the address uh, in your web browser. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And then pop-ups are bad, like seriously. No website worth anything today or since 1992 uses pop-ups in a web browser. If you get a pop-up in a web browser, I can 99% tell you that that is a bunch of junk. You do not want to use it, within reason. There might be a website out here that has it, but if you get a pop-up and it goes, you've been infected, you should do this thing. No, you should not do this thing. So here is one of those emails that I presented to you earlier. And uh, I just kind of like went through here and said, okay, well, why is this email bad? And this is what you guys need to start getting good at is when you get an email, why is this email not real? Well, for one, Microsoft probably isn't using that email address to email me. I could be wrong, but um, net.com, net again, if you look at the very last address in the URL, that's the one that matters. Just because it says MSN in there doesn't mean it's Microsoft. Net.com is where it's coming from. The next thing is, uh, this, this, feel, this first sentence feels like it's missing a word or two. We detected a recent sign-in Windows device. Uh, that doesn't sound like a multi-billion dollar company to me that sent that. Next up, this next sentence here is missing a period. The first two have them, this one doesn't. That's weird, right? Again, um, and then here, what the what? So this address here, if you look, I, I took my mouse and I hovered over the link. It's like blurry to me or just maybe I don't know. A little blurry. Uh, if I hover this over, this address pops up. It says www.unizar.es slash biohero meh something photos OneDrive OFP. Like that's not Microsoft. Uh, and .es is I think Spanish. I think it's Spain. Is it? Yeah. So something right there, right? And then down here again, this is my, my mom would be proud of me. Uh, it's missing a comma down here. Uh, so when you look at that, that isn't a multi-billion dollar email emailing you, right? A multi-billion dollar company emailing you. No way. So um, the next thing, when you're in a web browser, I went to Bank of America. You see the little lock right here? That lock, that means good. And the fact that it says the name there is good. And the fact that the web address is actually bankofamerica.com and not .net, ES, something. Those things are generally the things you want to look at. Here are things that don't work. So the first one, if you look, this one has the padlock and it says secure. Must be secure, right? No. Look at the address. PayPal notification dot yarnafleptap.gr. No. That, that isn't legit. So the reason why they can have that secure thing is they spent $99 and they verified that their domain address is legitimate. That's it. They didn't verify that they were PayPal. They identified that they own Yari Nafa That's what they own. So it pops up as secure because you are secure in that it is an encrypted channel between you and that website. But that ain't the website you're planning on going to, I bet. The next one, well, first off, not secure. That's just bad. And then the next one, if you look, this is our website here. I don't have a padlock. That doesn't mean it's a bad a website. I just don't want to put a credit card number or a username and password in it. We don't have anything on our website that requires encryption, so we don't have it. 
But those three things are all things that you want to be careful of. I'm over. I think I have three slides. Are we good? All right. So passwords. Do not use the same password on every website. Because when one website has a security compromise, then every other website that you belong to, you now have been compromised as well. Because you use your same email to log in. So if I have my MySpace, my MySpace password and I get hacked, my email address and password, they're going to feed it in to Microsoft and Facebook and Bank of America and all the major sites hoping that I've used the same email address and password on the same thing. This one actually I didn't put anywhere else, but uh, have I been pwned, so have I been owned but with a P instead of an O, that website allows you to put your email address in and it will tell you if there have been any breaches on the internet that, in fact, that impacted your email address. Because when major websites have a breach, they have to publish it. So they have a database of every email address that's ever been hacked on a public uh, site. It's and I would imagine an email could go out maybe for Peter. I'll, I'll have all these URLs later. Uh, use a complex and a lengthy password. So this website here, I, I tested my password changes in here. Chicken Man would take 24.47 minutes to crack, assuming 100 billion guesses per second which a computer actually can do. So if it's trying to brute force pat, track your password, it doesn't take that long at all. If I make the C and the M capital 2.44 weeks, if I add just a pound sign, I now have at 5.38 centuries. So just putting a capital letter in, a, in an additional symbol in the password makes it substantially harder to figure out. Change your passwords regularly. Maybe every 90 days. I know. Ooh, you don't remember all those things. I know. Um, Two-factor authentication. So that's where when you go to log in, it says, hey, I've just sent a code to your cell phone. Enter the code back in. That means I had to know my username. I had to know my password. And then it sends me something to my own private cell phone that I go and enter in the website. That's called two-factor authentication. And then do not enter your password into a site without making sure the padlock and the URL makes sense. Um, these are pretty quick. If somebody calls you, don't give them information on the phone. Hang up, call the company directly using their published phone number on their website to handle whatever business. But I would almost argue that no major company is going to call you and ask for, for personal information. They know that you shouldn't be doing it. And then if somebody leaves a phone on your voicemail and says, please call me about my account, Take the phone number, Google it. There's about 18 million sites out there that keep track of spoofed or hacker phone calls or scam phone calls, and they will tell you that these are scam phone calls. And if it's a legitimate phone number, chances are Bank of America is going to pop up in the first search result. So don't just call them back because they left you a voicemail. And then finally, if somebody texts you, do the same thing. Uh, here's some other just general stuff. Backup, backup, backup. Uh, you need it, because chances are somebody you know or you are going to get hit with ransomware and you're going to lose your kids' photos forever. You don't want to do that. Backup is way too inexpensive to skip on. I like Backblaze.com, but there's Carbonite, there's, there's a ton of them out there. <laughs> Ensure that you update and you patch your systems regularly. When it says there's an update to install, please let it be like an actual valid Windows update that you apply, not a website that pops up and says that you need to do it. But if your Windows computer says, or your Apple computer says that there's a major update, do it. Ensure that you have an antivirus program. Uh, Windows Defender comes with PCs for free. It's not terrible, not great, but it's not terrible. But um, make sure you don't have super duper anti-spyware Macs installed. Because <laughs> that's what you get when the pop-up pops up that says you're infected, please install this thing now. Uh, that's what it's going to be called most often, and it's junk. It's actually a virus itself. Uh, if you're a manager of a business owner uh, that has employees that report to you, have them trained. Okay, like what we just did right here, I would imagine somebody learned something, your employees would as well. And then always stay vigilant, vigilant and work on the assumption that nefarious people are trying to get you. I know it sounds tinfoil hat, but I'm telling you man, I've gotten like 12 emails in the last two weeks trying to get my stuff. They're, they're doing it constantly. All right, 
So I'm over, but Q and A, and I put on here throw me some softballs because my my mom's here and I want to impress her. So. <laughs> How, yes, sa how safe am I behind my provider's router? Um, so that would fall under the lines of the hacking botnet kind of world. Uh, the only thing that that is going to prevent is the outside getting in, but you are more the problem than that router is most likely. Uh, you're going to click an email that says validate your account and you're going to put something in it well before somebody hacks you through your router. Yes? Um, how much protection do you get, if any, by using a VPN either at home or when you're traveling? Good question. So if you're using a VPN on home or travel, um, it does help in that every bit of data that's transferred between you and your VPN provider is then encrypted. So uh, that helps. And if your VPN provider is also doing what's called filtering on their side, then it would be making sure that you're not going to bad places for the most part. So it's definitely a step forward. Uh, although I think it's a bit of snake oil. I see like late night TV now, they're uh, and radio ads are now advertising like 9.99 VPN. Um, I would say spend the money on a good antivirus and make sure you don't click on stupid stuff, more so than the VPN. But some organizations are going to require. It. Yes, ma'am. Do you think it's worthwhile to contact the company that is being represented by the spam email and report it to their fraud department? That are kind of wasting time. Are you retired? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't think you have enough time in the day. <laughs> I mean, we call those companies for legitimate tech support requirements, and we spend the four hours on the phone with people who know what they're doing. If you call them, you're getting like a high school kid who doesn't really care. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, just no. I mean, if you got time in the day, that's cool, but I ain't got a time. Anyone? Yes. How safe are when you go traveling or whatever using uh, free Wi-Fi? Like at the, at the Good question. So we're using free Wi-Fi here right now. Um, on the computer except you, for well, you made the cardinal mistake of allowing me to put a thumb drive in your computer, so you're not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, the Wi-Fi on traveling, uh, there's a few things. So number one, if it is an open Wi-Fi access point, chances are it's not fully encrypted. So unless you're going to a website that has the little padlock that says secure, I would not enter any significant information on those uh, websites. Uh, nor would I log into an account with six million dollars on it. Not that I have the ability to do that on a regular basis anyway, but I, I probably wouldn't if I were traveling in just some strange country and was using a free Wi-Fi. But if you do connect to it and they give you a, you know, a password, then at least between your computer and your wireless point, it is encrypted, so people can't sniff it from the air. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would just say if you're traveling, my suggestion would be to use the VPN. So if you're going to be doing anything, like if you're managing my account, Peter, and you're traveling, I want you to use VPN. I'll get you set up. I use it. <laughs> yeah. So I wouldn't do anything crazy over a free internet connection. I guess is the short answer. Yes, sir. You said something about VPN. I have no idea. Okay, so a VPN, uh, it stands for Virtual Private Network, and most people don't need it. But in the instance that you do, what it does is it ensures that everything that you have on your computer, that you're communicating from your computer to the mothership wherever, is, is encrypted. So it means, for instance, this laptop right now is communicating wirelessly. Nobody in here would be able to see what I was doing because it's encrypted. Uh, uh, it also means that from uh, the local hotel internet connection to wherever I'm trying to communicate is most likely encrypted. So it protects uh, people from snooping in on data. Prior to VPNs and prior to encryption, everything that we sent back and forth from the internet went in what's called plain text meaning that your credit card is bare to see, your passwords are bare to see. So a VPN plugs that hole, but it's, it's kind of paranoia, tinfoil hat kind of area for somebody who isn't doing a ton of really sensitive stuff in places that you can't trust. That help? Somewhat? Sure. It's software. It does magic. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Thoughts on the password managers that you can buy, like Roku, Chrome, 
Uh, man, I, I'm bitter. Yeah, I, I don't know how I feel about them. I use them myself. I let Chrome store my passwords. There's plenty of password managers out there that are real. Uh, I do. I know I'm not a real IT guy though. I, I just stand up and speak. James back there does. Uh, it it scares me, but it's so convenient. It really is. What's that? I believe it does. Yeah, I believe so. Um, now I'm scared. Oh, dang it. I was supposed to be scaring you guys, not scaring me. Uh, so I, let me finish. So the, the password thing, I love the convenience factor of it. If you go with a legitimate company, you're probably safe. I would definitely turn on two-factor authentication. Um, but just expect that if they get hacked, then you better go really, really quickly to change everything you have because they're there. Yeah. What are your thoughts about uh, different OSs and security and then uh, different browsers? Yeah. So I am a PC guy. I don't own a Mac other than my iPhone, so I can't really speak um, in anything more than just how I feel. My feeling is all of these systems are insecure, but I feel that Microsoft gets more attacked just because of the breadth of the deployment. There's a ton more business computers using Microsoft than there are Apple. Now that's changing. I would expect that we're going to start seeing more and more Apple things happening. Uh, but that, again, that's just gut feeling. Um, but I think that people go where the money is, they go where the ease is. There probably are more bugs and vulnerabilities in Microsoft than Apple, but I bet there's a ton in Apple that haven't been found yet, just because it's not worth it yet. That's yeah. why I just want to well, it comes down to opportunity, too. 90% of the machines out there are all Windows-based, so if you're actually going to, to actually make money on it, you're gonna go to the 90%, right? Uh, you're not going to target the 10% because it's not worth your time. You're going to make more money trying to focus on the thing that, that's more prevalent. Any other questions? What are the browsers? Any particular browsers? You want to take that one? Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> I love Chrome. Uh, it's fast, it's easy, it works. Uh, you know, uh, and just probably anything but Internet Explorer would be the answer I would give. Um, but Chrome is my favorite. I think it's pretty consistent across my entire team. They use Chrome. What do they what do you use? Not Chrome. Not Chrome. We use Firefox. 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 Yeah. So I mean, the Firefox, Safari, Chrome. I would say they're all equal. Um, people have their favorites. Apparently, mine stores the passwords in clear text, and I'm going to take care of that when I get back here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Tom. Can you explain Cloud Drop? Yeah, yeah. Are they so, secure? So, so man, uh, nothing is secure. I mean, that's that's the answer. Nothing is secure. There will be holes. There will be bugs. There will be compromises. Uh, everything that you put out on a computer is insecure. Nothing is 100 percent. With that said, there are more companies that are reputable than others. Uh, Dropbox is a pretty reputable company, as is a few others. Uh, would not be my favorite one to go towards, but uh, it's. It's the 800 pound gorilla, I would say. Um, I think that uh, explaining it, instead of it being stored on your computer, it's being stored in somebody else's. That's, that's really all the cloud is. Cloud is a marketing term as well. It just means I'm using a computer somewhere that I don't know where it is and it's doing something for me. That's all it is. The cloud isn't anything fancy, it's just a bunch of computers. All right, somebody gonna give me the hook? That was excellent, good job. So that was excellent. So a couple of items, it's interesting because uh, we get audited by the state of Florida every couple of years, and the last audit, the number one item they talked about was our cybersecurity. It was, they spent about a half a day going through making sure that we had it all prepared. Like we've seen a lot of changes with Fidelity, for example, where they'll send for like, for, we'll get emails from somebody saying, oh, by the way, please send me a wire. And we actually have to authenticate the person by voice. It's one of the requirements. And they give examples of issues with that. And as far as the two-factor identification, the program we're using now for tracking, you know, one on our website, the new one, you know, has that two 
factor of notification. It's a pain in the neck. Because you always get your phone, you get the text. You all find that pain in the neck too? No. You like it? Yes. Oh, yeah. I usually get the call, Peter, like Peter. Yeah. Well, that was excellent. Um, so at this point, any other questions or general questions about uh, identity theft? We decided to cybersecurity protection as opposed to identity theft this time.